nein, ich will nein, ich will nein, ich will nein. They had a successful film. There was already, uh, you know, a Friday the 13th too. I don't know whether right. there was already a Halloween too, but uh, uh, you know, the, uh, part of the idea was that, you know, if you had a successful horror film, you would definitely do a sequel uh, and you would make uh, some more money. So um, that was that was their, their hope. Um, I mean, they hired Wes to, to do the sequel but Wes really had very little to do with it. You know, he didn't write the script. Mm -hmm. um, he, he never particularly liked the concept. I mean, it, uh, he was always upset about the idea that Freddy comes out into the real world, you know, uh, as opposed to that he only comes out when you're asleep and you're, and you're dreaming. So he felt that it basically threw away the whole concept that he had. And um, the script was, was written by... David Chaskin. Yeah, who was, um, I mean, he never had a script produced. Uh, you know, he had, he had written a bunch of scripts, which most, most screenwriters have written a bunch of scripts before they ever get a script produced anyway. Um, uh, but, but uh, you know, Dave, Dave was, uh, you know, part of the, the distribution staff at uh, New Line. And I guess he, he, he pitched them an idea and they liked the idea. And so, so they went with it. Uh, you know, they weren't looking for a high price screenwriter, you know, right. that, uh, uh, and that was kind of how, how they approached it. You know, um, basically I was just given the script and this is what we're doing. And normally I, I, I have a lot of input into a script right. on the other movies that I've done, but on, on this one, it was, it was pretty much a, a fait accompli. And also there was like six weeks. So there really wasn't a whole lot of time. You know, I was just like scrambling to just try to, you know, prep the film so I could actually shoot it. You know, for, for me, it was very, very complicated. You know, it had all these special effects and right. all that stuff. Right. So, so Jack, uh, did you have a lot of contact with Wes Craven prior to working on this film? I mean, were you guys friendly? Did you speak about it beforehand? Did you take his input? Uh I'm trying, well, well, I had met Wes. Okay. Uh, but uh, we were certainly not, not friends. And I would say that we never really became friends. Um, I think he always had a little, you know, a little disdain for, for, for two. Uh, but but, but uh, if we weren't friends, we were certainly friendly. Um, okay. I mean, we didn't hang out, uh, but, but we, 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 we talked and he was, um, uh, you know, he was, he was always very cordial to me. Um, but I, I really don't think I ever had any contact with him when, once I got hired to, to, uh, to do the film. Uh, I mean, it, w it was all set up in, in LA and, and, and basically the train had already left the station. I mean, they'd already hired a couple of producers um, and the producers, I think they'd hired a production designer, which is usually, you know, one of the first people that, that you hire because you got it, you know, that, that takes a long time. And, and they had also um, brought back the same director of photography who had shot the original shock Haitken. So um, there, there was no cast. Um, they had not made a deal yet with, with uh, Robert England his agent was asking for more money and they didn't want to pay him. So they said, um, we're probably going to have to get somebody else that they thought that it was kind of interchangeable. Right. Uh, Whoa. And I, I said, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, so I had to, I was living in, in Manhattan. I had to go out to LA and, you know, uh, you know, basically just every minute of the day and, part of my dreams were just, just consumed with trying to get ready to shoot the movie. So um, I had very little input from them. The only, the only thing is they, the only thing that they really said was um, make Freddie scary. 
he's got to be dark. We can never like see his face completely lit up, even though the, the, the thing behind you, there's some light. But I mean, for the most part, he was, you know, he was always kept dark. And that was, and that was pretty much it. I mean, it was just, well, here's the script, you know, right. shoot, shoot the script, you know, do a good job and shoot the script. And I mean, they, they, uh, they knew that I understood, you know, how to like build scares and stuff like that, you know, how to create an atmosphere and all the rest of that stuff. Now, if, if they gave you more uh, creative control and more reins on the movie instead of like they already wrote it and they wanted somebody to direct and shoot the pages, um, would you necessarily agree with the concept of him coming out of the dream world and like changing it? Because it, it did feel what it felt like and probably from the writer, it felt a lot like Amityville to the, pos the possession. So it was more of like a possession. Yeah. Movie. Yes. Oh, did you agree with that kind of concept? I, I honestly didn't even think about it. Okay. When, when Bob called me up and asked me, or, or, or whoever it was from, from New Line called me up to ask me if I wanted to do the sequel, my, my first reaction was no. Because I, I, I wasn't that crazy about the first Elm Street. I mean, I thought it was a great concept. I thought the idea of Freddy was was really great and the fact that he was a real character um played by a, a, a terrific actor which which i think was um i mean it wasn't revolutionary because uh, you know back in the older days the, you know the monsters were interesting you know bella lugosi and lon right. chaney and all that uh you know they were really interesting characters but uh you know friday the 13th and halloween and you know i worked on this film called the burning that the weinstein brothers did that was their their first feature and the, you know basically there was this guy he would show up you know he would kill people and then he would disappear again you know and it didn't take a whole lot of skill from the actor you know like lift up the chainsaw and kind of <laughs> chop him in half or you know do whatever uh, uh so i thought that that was really good but um uh we didn't see it as a sacred text. Okay. You know, all, like, like I said, all they were doing was, was, was just to, to try to squeeze a little bit more money. And I, I never really thought about it, you know, that, that deeply. I mean, I saw it as a film about teen sexual anxiety. Um, and we we'll probably get into that later, but uh, um, so, so I was just, you know, I, I just accepted it at, at, at face value. I mean, the reason, actually the reason that I finally decided to do was, was a friend of mine said, Jack, don't be in, cause I wasn't that keen on doing another horror film. I didn't want to be known as a horror film director. Right. Uh, and and I, I particularly didn't want to be known as somebody who did sequels to horror films. But probably if I hadn't, it's very possible if I hadn't done Elm Street 2 that I wouldn't have been any kind of director, you know? That that you know, uh, alone in the dark would have been you know one and done. So, uh, a friend of mine said, you know, don't don't be an idiot. The film's going to make a lot of money, and you'll have a career. And he was absolutely right. So, and I figured, hey, you know, better better to do this than 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 not to do something else. So so that was kind of how I went. You know, wasn't like oh my god, this is the chance of a lifetime. You know, right. Uh, so, it was. So no, that was yeah. uh, that was my attitude. I mean. In terms of Freddy coming out into the world, I mean, if you think about it, let's say you didn't know anything about this. Let's say all you, all you knew was there was this movie and it was about this guy, Freddy, and he kills these, these kids when they go to sleep. And then you say, well, what does Freddy want? Well, Freddy, you know, Freddy wants to get out into the world and kill as many people as he can. But, you know, in the first one, he can only come out when you sleep, right? Right. So what would be the next step for him if he could do it? Possession, which yeah. is what he does. In order to come out when you're awake. So he can go to a pool party, you know, where there's 50 kids and, you know, try to kill 50 <laughs> kids instead of just having to pick them off one at a time. So, I mean, there's a kind of a logic to that, you know, and and I, I, I actually, uh, uh, you know, part Part of the thing that, that people used to say about Elm Street 2 was that, you know, it broke the rules and it wasn't good and it didn't, you know, because uh, a, a lot of that stuff. But, I mean, we didn't really see it that way. It was like its, its own movie, you know, it was like a riff on, on the original one. And, and I remember one of the early interviews that I 
did on uh, a, a, a podcast, I don't know, maybe maybe five, five or six, six years ago. Um, and and there were some, some comments about, uh, you know, that it didn't follow the original. And, and uh, there were these, uh, these uh, two young, young women who did the podcast. It's like an Elm Street podcast that I, right. I forget what, what, what they're called. But anyway, one of them went on and said, well, you can't look at it like it's, they're trying to do a copy of the first one. You just have to look at it as a separate movie that sort of has, has those same themes, you know? The only thing with that, yeah. and I agree with you, and you, it does have logic to it. As far, just for them, uh, for New Line Cinema, as far as a franchise would go, you would think that they would want to keep him in the dream world because they want to keep that concept going for the next couple of films and extend it. It was just weird that they, they took it because that guy, David Chaskin wrote it, who worked for new new line cinema, that they took it in a completely different direction or like he pops out. So it's just weird that maybe, but in your, like what you were saying before, maybe they didn't know it was a franchise yet. They didn't know what they had. You said they didn't even have him on the poster. Right. I, what what were they planning on doing? Having a different character then, instead of Freddy? No, no oh no, no, no. They oh, okay. uh, they're always going to have Freddy, right? Uh, like I mean, for them the concept was, you fall asleep, Freddy comes out, you know, in your dreams, and there's this character Freddy, and 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 I know that when before they made the film. Uh, when I had read like an early draft of, of, of the scripts and talking to Bob Shea and talking to Sarah Risher, who was, who was the head of production, they were really sort of like intellectually intrigued by the idea that this guy would come out in your dreams. That they just thought that this was like an awesome concept, that, that nobody had really done this. And that it was a great sort of premise for, for a horror film. So they were really excited about that. And, and I think that they were really excited about the character of Freddie. Right. Um, as far as like what all the rules were, I don't think they even paid that much attention. I, I mean, for the most part, he sort of comes uh, around when you're asleep. You know, he, he, he doesn't just come into the world just by wandering in. He has to go in through Jesse. So right. he does, you know, that's, that's his like his his trap door, you know, into the, into the real world. It's just, you know, it, it extends out of like the kids' bedrooms or, or, or whatever and goes into uh, uh, the wider world. But I mean, that's, that, that's how they saw it. They really didn't think, you know, deeply about like, like what all the rules were, because I think that, uh, you know, if, if you're really in, into the original, uh, Maybe you were, and and if you were into three and four, you know, then you you, you know, got the concept. But uh, obviously, two did better than one, right? Uh, and why did it do better than? Was it a better movie than one? Um, what it meant was that the concept uh, had had uh, real real traction, you know, and three did better than than two, right? Let me ask you this. Um, you know, I know it's 2020, so it's very different than the 80s and the type of movies that they were making back then. But did they ever consider to go more into his backstory in like one of the original drafts of the second movie, like to extend it? Because I've seen a lot of sequels where they don't do that. They don't want to reveal the monster and go back into the backstory in like an 80s movie, you know, in the Halloween series, Leatherface. But I was just curious if, if in this franchise that they wanted to explore more of his, his past. Because we, we really didn't see that at all uh, in the first movie at all. We just uh, hear about it. Well, it's I, just an opportunity. I, I can't answer that because I wasn't involved with the creation of the script. Right. I have no idea why they chose Dave Chaskin to write it. I have no idea what that process was. I have no idea what input Wes might have had. I have no in, in idea if, if any other writers pitched other concepts and they chose that one. And once I was done, you know, Elm Street 2 made, a, you know, had a very big opening weekend. And on Monday, uh, uh, 
I got a call from Dino De Laurentiis about doing yes. a movie for him. So I knew that, like, you know, I was done with Elm Street and I was on to the next thing. Right. That, that's amazing, Jack. So, Jack, you did mention briefly the subtext of the film and uh, that it was about team sexual anxiety. And for me, that's why I enjoyed this film so much, because I thought those were really interesting concepts that, especially at the time, uh, a lot of horror films either didn't deal with as directly or just neglected altogether. And as we've seen later down the road with films like uh, It Follows and uh, maybe even The Babadook in a certain way, those themes do seem to resonate with uh, audiences a lot. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more on your thoughts on that and how maybe your relation to like the actors and the writer kind of played with that whole thing. Well, I mean, um, as someone once, once asked me what, what the most important thing in a horror film is. And I said, having good characters, you know, um, which is, you know, not like, you know, having big scares, having, you know, the most original kind of murders and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a sort of a classical filmmaker. Um, and I, I believe that if you don't care about the characters, that, that, that none of it really matters that much, you know, if you're not invested in, in what's going on uh, and that that makes an interesting movie. And, and so I always feel there has to be a central theme, you know, a spine or a, a right. subtext or something that runs through the whole film that connects all the, all the pieces. And so I, I spent, and because as a director, you have to understand, I mean, look, everybody understands the plot. The plot is obvious, but it's like, what's underlying, what's right. underneath the plot? You know, like, you know, if you think of, 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 of E.T., what's E.T. really about? I mean, I would say that it, it's, it's about home. Mm. It's about family. It's about home, you know. I mean, E.T. even says it, home, you know. Yeah. Uh, and that's really what it's about. So if you understand that, it, it, suddenly it gives you an idea of, you know, what kind of a house do they live in? Do we want, we want to make that house something that's really cozy or... or you know, what do I, you know, how do we, it, it, it involves everything, light it, how I'm going to, you know, everything. So, so I always try to come up with that because, you know, there's a central concept. It's like, if you're the conductor of an orchestra, you're not just here to beat time. You have to have a concept of what this piece of music is and where it goes. And so that's, you know, because the New York Philharmonic doesn't need a conductor to play a Beethoven symphony. They can do it on their own, you know. Hopefully, what you know, what the conductor gives, what what a director gives, is 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 a point of view, is a coherence. So all of the factors point in 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 the same direction. So, so I mean, for me, that was, uh, you know, that was what it was about. Um, um, I didn't think really deeply about it. I've actually thought more about it lately because you know, <laughs> right. Uh, I keep getting interviewed about it and people ask me questions and it, you know, it makes me kind of think about stuff, but that like the whole sort of um, gay subtext or, you know, maybe it's not even a subtext now that's, that's, that, that's kind of, you know, one of the ways that, that people see the film. I mean, that never occurred to us. I mean, obviously there were uh, elements, uh, um, uh, you know, there's a scene in the gay bar and, and and there's a lot of that 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 kind of stuff in there. But you know, if you think about teen sexual anxiety, uh, you know, one of them is, uh, you know, you know, who am I sexually? Um, I mean, my teenage sexual anxiety was that, you know, am I ever going to get laid? But yeah. I mean, for other people, uh, I mean, I I remember my my agent telling me that when he was like fourteen or something, uh, he got a a physical from his doctor and uh, and the doctor did like an anal thing and he got a hard one and he thought oh my god i'm gay and he was completely <laughs> months you know uh so uh uh you know and and particularly you know if you if you are gay or or if you think you might be gay particularly you know in the early 80s when so you know aids was out right and gay people were demonized and all the rest of that stuff uh, you know, it was really uh, e extremely traumatic. So, yeah. So, so, Jack, what was like your reaction when articles came out that called this the gayest horror movie of all time? 
Well, the first, the first one that we saw was, I mean, nobody picked it up uh, in, the, in the reviews that, that came out when the movie opened. Uh, but right. the Village Voice, you know, which was the independent paper in New York that came out once a week on Wednesday, they, their review said it was the gayest horror film of all time. And, and I got a call from the head of production at, at New Line who said, hey, Jack, you're not going to believe this and read me the review. And we were like laughing that we just thought it was so crazy because none, no one had ever brought that up. Um, and, and even Mark Patton, you know, if you've seen his, his, uh, his, his uh, movie Scream Queen or, or, right. or, or I think also in the documentary Never Sleep, Never Sleep Again. Again. Mm-hmm. I mean, he didn't even get the, the gay subtext and he was gay, <laughs> you know, and he right. was, you know, he was, he was in, in, in the closet. And somebody on the crew, I think somebody from the art department or the makeup department or something, somebody, you know, said, Hey, don't you realize that there's this, and, and you know, and then he thought, oh my God, you know, uh, but, but I mean, he didn't pick up on it. And, uh, and certainly none of us at, at New Line ever picked up on it. it was never, you know, it was never part of the, part of the discussion. Uh, and, and even in terms of casting Mark, uh, I mean, the idea that he, that he was gay never, it, you know, it just wasn't even part of the conversation. It was just, Wow, he you know he he's really good for this role. I mean, we we needed someone who was. I felt we needed someone who was very vulnerable, and, right? Uh, and and I guess you know I maybe intuitively picked up on 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 the other stuff because I mean he is like the final girl, but he's like the final guy. You know, he's he's really the the victim. And I mean, there is a lot of stuff where his, you know, his masculinity is questioned and, and all of that. So I guess, you know, I just sort of uh, intuitively, but I, I had no idea he was gay. I, I think somebody told me somewhere, you know, while we were shooting or, you know, toward <laughs> the end that he was, but um, it never came up. Uh, never, no one at New Line ever, ever brought it up. And believe me, they would have, you know, right. Can I make right. a comment about this? I, yeah. I really, because yeah. I have a strong feeling about this. And there's nothing wrong with it being the, deemed as the gayest movie, a uh, horror movie of all time. But when I watched this, I had no idea anything like that. I didn't get any kind of vibe that it was any kind of gay movie. As far as theme goes, I kind of looked at it as like this guy kind of had this insecurity and it was kind of like love conquers all. So he, together with Lisa, she overcomes this evil, this Freddy. And I looked at, instead of him coming out of the closet, which is what they described late in later years, I always looked at it as this guy was just an insecure guy. And I really, you know, to drive that home is to defer the opening scene. You see him on the bus and like, it's a dream sequence. So you kind of see him as his true self. And he's kind of this nerdy guy who's sweating in the back of the bus. And like, he doesn't, I don't know. It's just, he probably questions who he is. I don't know if that's what you got out of it from reading the script, but from watching it, that's what I got out of this film. Well, yeah, that was, that was pretty much how I saw it. Yeah. Uh, In fact, it was, it, it, it was interesting. I mean, when, when we were shooting the film, you know, Mark and I, we had our, we had a strictly professional relationship. He right. he was kind of standoffish, and we never hung out. We never sat down and had a serious talk. We never had a beer. We never did any of that stuff. I mean, he was, really? you know, he was he was very professional to work with, and and we had a very good working relationship, but we had no personal relationship what whatsoever. Uh, uh, and, and and it really wasn't until. Uh, there was like a 30th reunion at a convention, I guess in Fort Lauderdale, I think it was. Uh, and I hadn't seen him since, since we made, made the film. And, and then I, you know, I started to get, get to know him. And, and initially there was a little, there was a little tension. Uh, you know, he, he was still kind of, you know, up, upset about Dave Chaskin and that they put this gay subtext in. And I'm thinking like, you know, uh, let it go, man. It was like 30 years ago. Um, 
you know, but he, he, he had a different take on it. And, you know, over, over the years, we've done a bunch of conventions and we've really gotten to know one another and we've really gotten to, to understand and really care for one another. Um, and, and it was funny because he, 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 he showed me that there was an article about the film in Fangoria where they interviewed him. I don't know whether you saw it, but uh, whoever wrote, wrote the article said the key scene in the film was the scene on the bus. And he said, you know, this is like every gay man, you know, this is, this is what, you know, you, you're the outsider, you're being laughed at, you feel uh, like you have to hide it and, and all the rest of that. And when I finished reading the article, I said to Mark uh, that, 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 that the way that I saw the film was that that was me in the back of the bus. That was probably one of you guys in the back of the bus. Right. Uh, so, uh, and, and I think, you know, Mark, I think that that really brought Mark and me closer in, in, a, in a way, because I mean, that was how I saw it. You know, I mean, you know, I, 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 when I was young, I kind of felt like an outcast. And, you know, I think a lot of people who, who are into horror films probably felt that way growing up, you know? So, uh, you know, and, and the catharsis of, of, of a horror film, you know, that very often, the one who, who, who gets picked on is, is the one who ends up saving everybody, you know? See, yeah. that's, that's why I, I like this, um, this sequel probably the best because of this. I love the character, his character, because in the first one, uh, Nancy is just like strong person who fights back and almost kicks Freddy's ass towards the end. And, and Mark's character as Jesse is this guy who's timid and afraid and like Freddy could be, he, right? So kind of the concept stays in this movie that he, he preys off of fear. So like this guy was like the perfect guy for Freddy to like really scare. And I just, I, I love that he wasn't this, he was this timid character. He wasn't this strong willed character towards the end, until the end, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And I gotta say, Jesse probably puts one of the best performances at yes. the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. Yeah, he's so. a wonderful actor. Really, yeah, great. I, I wish that he made more movies. Yeah, yeah. Huh. yeah. Well, I mean, that's a whole story, you yeah. know. So, but I mean, if you, you know, if you think about it, if if you decide that you're going to do a, a possession movie, I mean, what is, what is possession? Uh, like, like a lot of people say, oh, oh, he, you know, he's trying to get into my body, you know. And they're all of these, you know, you can go. You can go on on the internet and find these lists of you know fifteen things reasons why it's the gayest movie of all time. And by the way, let me let me say that I'm 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 happy for people to say that. Um, I I I uh, I'm actually glad that there's that 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 whole you know that 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 whole kind of community can feel that that there's something that they can identify with. You know, right. even though that 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 wasn't what I set out to do. It's it's right. it's, it's it's actually been a uh, a, a collateral benefit, and I'm 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 very happy about that, and 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 I don't have the least the least bit of problem about that. Um, but you know, if you think about possession, it's like well, love is possession. You know, like people are possessive. You know, uh, and and uh, I, I you know, if you're in love, you sort of want to possess this other body. You want to sort of meld yourself into this other you know and 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 all that kind of stuff so i mean just just by definition a possession movie or possession story has that kind of intimacy right yeah jack i gotta say what um, did anthony 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 wanted to say something i wanted to say something real quick just jack uh if you see on my back wall that's the for the movie possession so that's just the theme that's one of my favorites Uh sorry anthony go ahead oh Uh, yeah jack i wanted to I want to ask you, um, that scene when uh, Freddie's coming out of uh, Jesse's chest, oh, yeah. I think I can speak for all of us here. <laughs> that is one of the most awesome scenes throughout the whole franchise. I just want to know, because I'm very into special effects, I'm actually an artist myself. How, what was even involved in that? Like, how long did that even yeah. take to do? Well, um, so uh, usually these makeup special effects um are are very laborious it's almost like like doing animation um i mean the the fact that i did a lot of trailers for 
for New Line. You know, and New Line had like a lot of karate movies and they had some horror films. And they had some, you know, cheap ripoffs offs of, of, of other successful films. So I kind of would like see how stuff got done just by editing, you know, that if you had, you know, four little pieces that it, you could make it seem like one thing happened. So I kind of had an idea of how to do this. So I, I, I designed those sequences. We, yeah, we had two, two make, well, well, we actually had three makeup teams, but I mean, there were two main, main makeup teams. There was Kevin Yeager, who mm. was basically doing Freddy. It's amazing. And, 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 and the, the more high end stuff. And, and then there was Mark Showstrom and his group who were doing the more, you know, splattery things. And, 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 and uh, the more sort of Fangoria stuff. Um, and, and Mark, um, uh, his, his group was responsible for, for, that, for that sequence. Um, so a lot of it was in the script. You know, it sort of described it in, in, in the script. And I, I'm not exactly sure who did what, because a lot of times the makeup people will have an idea of how to do something. Uh, but um, I know we had the whole thing storyboarded and I'm, I'm very meticulous about planning out all the shots. Mm. I, 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 every movie I've ever done, and I've done 15 of them, I, I've had a shot list of the entire movie before we started shooting. It doesn't mean that we stuck to it exactly, but I, I had the whole thing planned out. So the second, so the makeup sequences are normally shot by second unit because the first unit works with the principal cast. So if you're working with models and stuff like that, then um, you're not going to be, uh, that's, that's going to be second unit because it, it's very slow. It's laborious. You also don't need 50 people in the crew to stand by while it takes an hour to get an effect ready. And then, you know, take two, some takes another hour so um uh, so there was a second unit now fortunately we were shooting on a stage and so um uh that that set was a set that we had uh, uh you know shot the earlier scene with 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 uh, uh robert rustler and 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 uh mark mark Patton. And and then when we were done, then this, the uh, the makeup crew took over and went in there and we're doing it. So I I had the um, the ability during a you know breaks unit action to run over to the second unit to just check and see how 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 they were doing. Um, but uh, uh, for instance, I mean one one of my favorite shots is when he screams and you can see the eyeball down his throat. Oh, so cool. I just love that. But that was in the script. I mean, I you know I would love to say that that was my idea, but um, it it was actually in the script. And I mean, we had a storyboard, and you know, basically, that was what what they had to do was to 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 more or less create the the makeup effect that would give you that image in 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 the storyboard. You know, get it get it get it lit right. properly and all that but but you know all those pieces were 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 carefully planned out you know what like like you were doing animation you know it's like bit by bit by bit by bit you know how can we make it seem that this is happening right jack was was there anything that you added to the script that, that you kind of changed it or any of the scenes were different not that not really not not really i mean um I I pretty much shot the script. I mean, I have a point of view. Right. I mean, I mean, you can go and see a production of Hamlet that's done one way, and you can go and see another production of Hamlet that's done a completely different way, and it's the same exact text, but the whole concept is different. You know. Right. So yeah. I mean, like I said, I I I I. Uh, I mean, there were certain people who direct these movies who are like, they talk, they talk, they talk, now we have this great cool sequence. Then they talk, they talk, they talk. Well, well, I mean, for me, the talking part was actually, has always been uh, Im important, you know, and and the 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 action stuff, the horror stuff kind of takes care of itself. Like, I mean, you can do it really great or you can do it not so great, but, um, 
you know, it, 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 it usually works. I mean, I mean, one of the things about, you know, the early 80s was there were people who were doing horror films who had no idea how to shoot a movie. Um, and, uh, because, you know, I, I, I had been working at, at, as an editor. So uh, uh, there were these, uh, you know, places that rented out editing rooms. So there'd be, you know, half a dozen films that were being edited, you know, right around you. And, they, you know, sometimes there would be like, some editor who was editing some low budget horror movie who was like tearing their hair out because <laughs> they couldn't make a sequence work because they were missing shots, right. you know, and it just, they cut it together and they just didn't have the shots. Not that, enough that coverage. Right, and, right. and in fact, uh, uh, in fact, you know, one, one of the things that, that, that Bob used to say to me was that he hired me because he knew that I'd get all the pieces. Right. You know, because, because, you know, I was in that, you know, whether the pieces would be any good, you know, who knows, but at least I'd have all the pieces. So, you know, it's kind of like a Tinker Toy set, you know, that you didn't have the piece, then everything would fall down. So at right. least we have all of the pieces, you know. Right. So there's a piece of this film that I found really interesting that you do normally see in other horror films. But for this one, it seems to work better. And that's the very end, the last few shots when they're back on the school bus. Oh. Now, the way I viewed it was that this was a character who was trying to repress things that took the form of Freddy, and it came out, and uh, Lisa allowed him to repress that for real, right? And he completely repressed that. But now you can't actually repress these kind of feelings because you're back, it's back to get you at the end on the school bus. So is that the way you intended it to happen, or is that just kind of here's a horror film trope getting thrown back in the uh, so the whole uh, subtext of that is this was sort of um, very important for New Line. Right. That we need to set up something so that there could be a sequel. Right. That was exactly what it, what it was all about. And, and I mean, look, the, the fact is that, uh, you know, if it's a horror film, you know, anybody who's killed can always come back. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. uh, uh, but I mean, um, you know, if you know anything about the original Elm Street, uh, they they changed the ending uh, to to put in. Uh, I don't know. They 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 reshot like two different endings because they wanted to make sure that they had something that felt like it could be a sequel. You know, like Freddy still lives. You know, he can come back again. So. Right. And okay. that was. And I I I I actually. Uh, I mean, it was it was kind of cheesy, and everybody kind of knew that it was. You know, it was sort of tacked on to just really say, hey, Freddy's Freddy's still around. And um, I, I didn't think it was one of our best effects, you know. Okay. Uh, right. and, and I think it was also kind of like one one take. So you can kind of see uh, uh, <laughs> the girl where it comes out of her chest kind of like going, <laughs> like taking <laughs> a breath before the lines because you didn't want to screw it up, you know. Oh, right. And this thing kind of burst out. <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, if if we'd had more time, I probably would have done a few more takes because it you know it wasn't perfect, but uh, you know that was that was all we had, and, and 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 nobody really cared that much about it because it just felt like it was a tack on to the. Right. Okay, right, Jack. We're uh, we're coming to the end of that show, but I, I have to ask you one of these last questions about Elm Street Two because this has been bugging me for about fifteen twenty years now. Why? <laughs> did freddy when he loses the glove and jesse has a glove what what was the choice of having him have these burnt hands with the blades coming out of his fingers who who made that up well i i'm pretty sure that that was in the script uh are are you talking about the 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 transformation scene or are you talking about no throughout the film once jesse like he he gets the glove towards the end too like the third the third act when freddie's like killing everybody you see his hand has blades on it instead of his glove he doesn't wear the glove right right yeah yeah the 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 idea behind that which i mean um wasn't really my idea but but that what had happened was that when when he took over Jesse, um, instead of having a glove, Jesse's hand became the glove. Right. So uh, Jesse and Freddie are now interchangeable. Right. Or 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 at least Freddie has the ability to 
turn into Jesse. Okay. And, so, and, and honestly, it's a little bit confused, I have to say, if, if, if I think back on it. Um, but because in the transformation scene, the blades come out of Jesse's fingers. And right. It's not a glove that comes out of his hand, but it's, it's, a, it's a new hand that when Freddie then appears after that in the, in the party that, that he's, you know. Okay, yeah, you're right. That Jesse. So that was, that was the idea behind that. I gotcha. All right. Um, yeah, thank you so much for talking about Elm Street 2. Uh, the last question I'll ask is for all the viewers out there of whoever is an aspiring filmmaker and they want to try to break into the horror business or be a director, do you have any kind of advice you could give them to somebody who's trying to do it in 2020? Well, um, I was really lucky because, you know, it, it was not very easy to make, you know, it, it was very expensive and you need a lot of equipment and you needed all kinds of stuff to make a movie. And, uh, you know, I, I was a very lucky to make my first movie. You know, if I hadn't met Bob Shea, uh, you know, uh, and, and a whole bunch of other things, um, uh, that wouldn't have happened. And, and if Nightmare 2 hadn't come along, you know, I might have left with having only done one, one feature instead of, you know, 15. Right. Uh, so that was luck. But now, um, anybody can make a movie. I mean, you can, you can make a movie for, for pretty much nothing, you know. Uh, you can shoot a movie on your iPhone, um, you know, and, 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 and basically um, what makes a good movie? Is it beautiful production value? Well, I mean, that can be good, but there's plenty of films with gorgeous production value that suck. Uh, <laughs> I, agree. Yeah. I mean, so, so what you need is a good script and good performances. And if you have those two things, I mean, even in a horror film, if you have a good script and good performances, um, it'll, it'll be a good film. You know, um, it may not appeal to everybody, but, you know, at that price point, it doesn't have to. Right. I mean, the, movie, the movies that I made had to make money because they cost money, you know. Um, nowadays, you know, if, if, if you really believe in something, but, uh, but I would say if, if you, if you want to be a director, you have to have a vision. It's not just like, Oh, I'm going to do this shot. I'm going to do that shot. It's like, well, how, do, what connects all the shots together? What connects all the pieces of the story together? What connects all the characters together? You know, what, what's, what's, what's going on. So, you know, for instance, you know, if, if you say that, that Elm Street two is about teen sexual anxiety, well, it's not just Jesse who has it. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Robert, Robert Rustler, had, you know, he just, you know, he, he, uh, he sort of acts in a real macho way, but, but he's kind of dealing with, with the same thing or, or, or even sort of harassing uh, the character of Jesse, you know, and Lisa's dealing with, with the same thing. And, and there's the subtext, you know, the, the how the coach fits in. And uh, so the, there's a central concept and, you know, it, it's not necessarily that easy to, to figure that out. I mean, a, a, a lot of times it can take me, you know, days to really think and think and think about it until something pops up that feels really right. Like a lot of times something will pop up and I'll think, oh boy, you know, I'm glad that popped up because now I don't have to think about this anymore. And then <laughs> right. just know it's not quite right. It's not quite there. And when you get it, it just suddenly, ah, that's it. You know, I, I, I kind of found it. And then once you have that, then, that because as a director part of what you do is you get everybody else who's working on the film to see the film the same way as as you do and by having that central concept that's that's one major major way to get everybody to see that film the same way because if it's just this happens and then this happens and then this happens it's just a whole bunch of separate unconnected pieces but if you say to a creative person, to a director of photography or a production designer or a costume designer, the film is about teen sexual anxiety, it, it gets their own juices going and then they start coming up with stuff, you know? And, right. And there's a kind of a, voca you know, a, kind of a vocabulary that, 
you know, and, and a common viewpoint that everybody has that then makes, makes things align. No, absolutely. I, I definitely agree with you. And I, I write too, and, and so does Rob. And uh, I know exactly what you're feeling. I felt that a couple of days ago where you're thinking, 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 and then all of a sudden you're walking and something pops into your head and you're like, oh, there it is. It right. makes sense. Like this, why didn't I think of this? And then it's almost like a euphoria and a relief that you thought about this. And it's like, okay, now it makes sense. And then you, you feel it in your gut and your chest. And it's just like, Yes, I want to make this. And that's that's oh. exactly what I was going to say. What I was going to say is, <laughs> if you don't feel it in your gut, it's right. probably not there. You know, if you feel it, you know, if you think it in your head, but you don't feel it in your gut. Like I mean, when when I've been doing movies, you know, uh, if I'm watching a performance and I feel it, if I'm yeah. casting and I feel it, then I know that it's that it's right. And you. It's very easy to talk yourself into that it's right. But if you have to do that, it's not right. You know, I mean, when it's right, I mean, when you've experienced that moment, you as a writer, Chris and, and Rob, you need to remember that feeling. And that's what you got to look for to guide you. I no, definitely. I, uh, I last year I uh, well, a year and a half ago I shot one of my first uh, short films. It was like a horror, it was a horror thriller, and there was a moment where the two actors they just created this moment on camera, and it was like one of the best highs of my life yeah. because it just connected, and I just like oh my god this is this is yeah. wonderful yeah and um, you know moments like that. Cause I, I'm, I'm aspiring. I'm trying to be a director as well. And I write and I, I direct my own short films. And sometimes, you know, you feel like, Oh, when's it going to happen? This and that. But then there's moments where things just flow and uh, the passion comes out of you. And you're just like, I got to make this. And I don't care if people like it or not. I got to yeah, do it. That's, that's it. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's the real high of, of, of uh, you know, doing this. Like, it, you know, it's hard and, uh, you know, there's a lot of mind games and, you know, ah, it's not working out and, <laughs> and a lot of doubts, but, but then you have those other moments and, 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 and that's kind of what you, uh, you know, what you hope, right? You know, when you just, you, you just, the, the ball comes and hits the bat in exactly the right spot and the, you know, and it goes out, you know, into the bleachers and, you know, uh, and those are the great, I mean, that, that, that's the best thing about the job is when you have those moments. Well, you, you, you know, did I can it also with, tell yeah. you that I've had some of the worst moments of my life. If you know. <laughs> <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> but you did it. You did it with this movie because even if you said people didn't like it, I loved it. And, and it scared me when I saw it. I mean, yeah. I, I just did. Freddie was dark. I, I loved it. Um, I love the theme that I thought it was. Like I told you about the insecurity and uh, this movie left me wanting to see the next movie. And I went out and bought three, four and five after I did, I watched this. So um, listen, Jack, thank you so much. I'm like a kid in the candy store right now that we, we interviewed <laughs> you. I was dying to do this. Um, but like I said, this is one of my favorite horror movies of all time. So thank you so much for taking the time out and coming on our podcast. Well, it's yeah, been thank you, Jack. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. It's been nice, nice talking to you guys, and um, uh, I'm I'm glad that I had a chance to podcast. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Jack. Thanks, it was Jack. A, it was a pleasure. Definitely. Thank you, guys. Okay.